everyone, this is Stephanie, writer for the Stats on the Tee tennis blog, where it's all about tennis data and statistics. So I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia, and this is the first video cast that I'm doing for the blog. I thought this would be an interesting way to make data science a bit more personable, so a bit of an experiment, but we'll see how it goes. Now, if you're tuning into this, you probably know about the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. It just finished up last week, and although there wasn't any tennis papers in this year's research competition, I think there were some interesting research presented that has implications for tennis. So I wanted to use this first episode to tell you about three of the most interesting papers to come out of this year's Sloan Conference. So we're gonna talk about three different areas of research. The first is shot effectiveness, which is all about what characteristics distinguish good shots from poor shots. Next, player movement. And here we're gonna look at some modern technologies that are helping us to get richer information about athlete body position than ever before. Finally, shot sketches, which sounds a bit mysterious, but it's really just about looking at patterns of play in a more objective way than we've done in the past. So you've probably noticed that Sloan's gotten pretty glamorous over the years. For me, the heart of the conference is still the research track, and hopefully by the end of this video, I'll convince you that these are some of the more interesting research directions that sport's taking. So the first paper I wanted to talk about is called A Data-Driven Method for Understanding and Increasing Three-Point Shooting Percentage. And this was written by Rachel Marty from UC San Diego and Simon Lucy from Carnegie Mellon. So this paper is all about trying to understand what makes a good three-point shot. Now you might think that the MBA would have already solved this problem given all of the amount of data and analytics that have been going on in that sport. But surprisingly, the authors point out that the shooting percentage from the three-point zone has stayed at 35% for over 20 years. So the whole three-point revolution that we've seen in the sport is really about attempts. So um, players are just going for the three more often, but their actual shooting effectiveness has remained stagnant. So these authors want to try to find out, you know, how can we improve and move that percentage up and the way that they go about doing it is to actually collect some new data. So they put a sensor over the hoop and that allows them to look over a large number, over one million shots, at the physics around the hoop so they can look at things about the angle, the depth, in more detail than, than ev has ever been done. So this diagram does the best job of explaining exactly what kind of information the authors were working with in this paper. So you can see from the left to the right panel some of the different attributes that the authors extracted from these sensors that were put on the hoops. So on the far left, you have a measure of the left rightness of the shot. In the middle, they're illustrating how they were assessing depth of shot. And then finally to the right, you have various information about the angle of the shot. The authors put all of these attributes together and then they defined something called the Guaranteed Make Zone, or GMZ, which is an area around the hoop that was associated with a 90% or better shooting percentage. So sort of the sweet spot for shooters. What they did was to use fairly standard methods to look at how the different attributes that they got from the sensor data, like depth, were related to the GMZ. And this could help them identify what they described as actionable factors, so things that the shooter would have control over, that could be modified to help improve shooting. So how can this work on three-point shooting be of relevance to tennis? I picked this paper out because I think it really raises an interesting question when we think about tennis. Just like shots in the NBA, we can look at shots in tennis and ask what makes a good shot versus a poor shot. And I think there's still a lot we don't understand about that. We have this way of classifying shots as errors, unforced, forced, or winners, or just shots in play. And that's really pretty crude and subjective, and we know um, isn't really telling us the whole story. And it certainly doesn't tell us anything about what characteristics of the shot would distinguish a winner from um, an error. And 
that's what we really need to know if we're gonna understand how we can help players to know how to improve. So I think this paper by Marty and Lucy is a you know, interesting way to show a possible approach that we could take um, with tennis tracking data or maybe collecting you know, more um, wearable-based information about the characteristics of shot and start to understand what distinguishes the best shots in the game um, from less effective ones. So the next paper I wanted to tell you about is called Body Shots, Analyzing Shooting Styles in the NBA Using Body Pose. And this one was written by Panna Felsen from UC Berkeley and Patrick Lucy from Stats. So this paper is similar to the one we talked about before. It's also interested in the anatomy of the three-point shot and what makes some shots more effective than others. But it takes a totally different angle. Here, this paper is looking at how player body positions, so the actual position of their arms, their legs, what that has to tell us about what makes a good shot um, and what makes a poor shot. Felsen and Lucy provide a really nice illustration to show this whole notion of pose and the kind of information that they were working with in their paper. So if you first look at the top panel, all of those three diagrams show one player in the process of making a three-point shot attempt. And if you look at the positions of the players, particularly the shooter, it doesn't really look like much is changing. And this would be the information that you would get from SportsVU tracking data. If you look below, here the authors show in sort of a marionette form the position of the limbs of the shooter and any players in the vicinity. And you can see that compared to the top panel, there's a whole lot that's changing from frame to frame in the course of the shot attempt, beginning with the shooter starting out in a very off-balance position, recovering, and then getting a fairly open shot um, to make presumably the best and most effective uh, position among these three. So this gives you an idea of how the authors were working with pose information to go beyond sport view. Now when I first read this paper, I figured that all of the data about the body position of players was coming from manual coding. So that probably meant a lot of boring internships for some legion of UC Berkeley students. Um, but actually, it turns out that there are um, algorithms out there that can do this just from a single camera video broadcast, which is pretty amazing. So there's actually this group at Carnegie Mellon in their Robotics Institute um, that have created a method called convolutional pose machines. And this is the approach that is used in uh, this paper, Body Shots, to try to extract information about 17 different body position attributes. And that's the main source of data for this paper. So it's pretty exciting when you think about the possibilities of using data like this, since we have troves of match video that are available where we could potentially apply this method and get a whole new set of information about player body position. So to give an idea of some of the applications that could be used with this pose information when it comes to understanding NBA shooting, the authors did some specific analysis of Steph Curry, um, the poster child for the three-point shot. So what you see in this figure on the left-hand side are different shot attempts on each row of Steph Curry. And you can see overlaid is the pose information about the position of his various limbs. And on the right-hand side are the corresponding pose information just by themselves. What's interesting is if you look in the areas where um, Curry's actually making a shot attempt, you can see that he's clearly in motion, off balance, on one leg, things that we kind of have associated with his shooting style, but it's just interesting that with this paper's methodology, they can actually um, extract that information and start to quantify it more directly. So this shows some of the really fascinating possibilities of what this kind of pose information could be used for in sport. These papers on shooting um, follow a, a trend that came out of this year's Sloan Conference, which is showing us the limitations of tracking data. So basketball has sports for you, which captures player and ball movement. But both these, these papers point out how 
how much we still don't know that we would like to know as analysts to be able to understand what's happening um, with player performance. And it's equally true with tennis. So even with Hawkeye, which is kind of the most cutting edge data that we regularly collect on tennis matches, that still just gives us an XY coordinate for a player at any particular time. We don't know what type of position they're in at any particular time, um, whether they're making a shot and how they're trying to make it. All of these things that we really do need to understand. And you could imagine with that kind of information, there would be a whole set of questions we could start to look at, like how much is player balance associated with shooting efficiency? Or what are the body mechanics that make Rafael Nadal have such crazy amount of spin? All of these kinds of things um, that I think would really open up a whole new area of research. So it's pretty exciting to see that there's already these methods being applied out there that we as tennis researchers could start to use ourselves. So the last paper in our group is called Possession Sketches, Mapping NBA Strategies. So it's another basketball paper, this one written by Andrew Miller and Luke Bourne um, at Harvard and Simon Fraser. Um, so Luke Bourne always thought that was a great like superhero name, but actually both of them are associated with the XY research team, um, which also includes Kirk Goldsberry. So a really smart group of analysts producing a lot of interesting research over a number of years, um, mostly for the MBA. And in this paper, um, they're interested in trying to see how we can actually use machine learning tools to break down different types of patterns of play and it's really the first paper in the group that we've discussed that starts to take into the temporal aspects of events and more about the sequence, um, which is really uh, an important advance and one that every sport is going to need to consider. So one of the first things that Miller and Bourne had to do to start to look at possessions in the MBA was to define an action. And these are sort of equivalent to to words as they make up sentences. So the actions are the, the things that would make up a possession. And here you can see um, the approach, an illustration of the outcomes of the approach that they use, which was essentially to take several seconds of activity and to apply some functional data clustering approaches. So a totally unsupervised method. So they're not making any assumptions about the kinds of actions that should be seen. But it's interesting, here you can see in gray, these are the representatives for four different types of actions that came out of their um, data analysis. And in blue are specific actual observed actions that would be assigned to that particular cluster. So this is a way that we can, without making any kinds of assumptions, identify similar actions. And these become sort of the units of analysis for their possession model. So once the authors have broken down different types of actions based on player tracking data, they then have to try to figure out how to look at patterns of play and take into account that some actions are going to take place at the same time or very close in time than others and that that matters when we think about um, the nature of a possession. So interestingly, I, and I think probably one of the, the smartest things about this paper is that the authors recognize a connection when we're thinking about a pattern, so it's a series of events that often occur together that it's very similar conceptually to when we think about assigning topics to different documents. So being able to show that two documents are related in the nature of their topic is a lot like saying that you know, two types of plays um, are similar as well. So once they make that conclusion, they can look to textual analysis, which is a pretty established field, and look at some of the machine learning methods that have been de developed there to assign topics to documents and they're able to apply that same approach to the MBA setting to identify types of possessions. So the way they go about doing this is to put together pairs of actions, so two actions that occur at the same time in a game, and then they treat those um, almost like words in these textual analysis um, methods. And with the way that words occur together, that's able to identify topics 
and that's the equivalent here to a possession. So, so in the end, they get a series of, of related patterns based on these action pairs. So once the authors have this possession model in place, there's some really cool things that they can do. Effectively, they can build an entire database that can be searched on a variety of characteristics to find information about possessions that involve a particular kind of play or a particular team or player. Here to kind of illustrate some of the things that could be done with this method, the authors took uh, four types of similar possessions of Chicago and Brooklyn. So each frame shows each team playing a similar possession. So you can see the layout of the players and the authors actually provide animations to give a better idea about the events that take place in these positions. But this gives you some sense of the way that we can start to actually have more model-based approaches to looking at patterns and deciding on the kinds of video analysis that we would do for a particular sport. This last paper, Possession Sketches, I guess the real thing that is interesting for tennis from it is its ability to start to look at, at the event sequences and patterns of events and actions and how that matters for understanding plays and, and game strategy. So um, the implications are pretty clear for tennis. I mean, when, when we think about what makes certain types of shot more effective, we want to know not only what the player making that shot is doing, but also what their opponent is doing, where are they positioned. So these are all simultaneously occurring events, um, but every, all, all of that information matters for understanding how that shot's um, effectiveness plays out. Um, so I think you, know, you could envision one day where we could have machine learning methods that would be able to pull up a whole set of related you know, inside out forehand plays or down the line backhand plays and start to understand not only what are some of the most similar patterns, but what makes some patterns more effective than others. So that's it for me. I hope you found this discussion interesting. And you can look to the Sloan site if you want to read up the full background on any of these papers. I also have links to them on um, my associated blog post. Um, so definitely check that out and hope to see you soon.